Hi everyone, welcome back to Rachel's studio. I'm so excited about today's tutorial. It's gonna be about all things tea consistency, watercolor paint, and what you can do with it, what it is, and then I'm gonna show you a little demonstration how to mix tea consistency paint and some, and then I will show you uh, clips of me painting actual watercolor paintings that are taken from tutorials that I do for my Patreon tutorials. So let's jump right into this watercolor goodness. All right, so what tea consistency paint is, is basically the most watery paint you can mix up. So when you paint with tea consistency paint and it dries, it's gonna give you very light effects. Next, I'll do a little demonstration for you about mixing up tea consistency paint and then doing some of the basic brush tricks. And then after that, we'll get to the really good stuff where I'm using it in actual real paintings. Remember with cream consistency paint, I dipped just the tip in to mix my cream consistency paint. With milk consistency paint, I dipped the whole bristle in, and I might've wiped off a bead though. With tea consistency paint, which is the wateriest consistency of paint, I'm gonna dip the whole brush, even maybe past the bristles. And so I've got a drippy brush now, and I'm gonna get some paint, and I'm gonna add water. I'm gonna add more water. You can keep adding water even after you've dipped your brush. You can put some paint on your palette, smear it around, and then go in for some more water. It just depends on how watery you want it. And tea consistency paint, it will run readily when you tip up your palette. Let's see what techniques that we can do with it. So here we go with wet on dry. The most straightforward stroke. All right, let me do that again. Wet on dry. Like I've been saying, you can do dry on dry even with tea consistency paint, but there is a bit of more of a trick. You want to get the excess out of your heel and then just have paint in your tip. It should be called fast on dry instead of dry on dry because this is not dry paint. It's tea consistency, but I did dry out my brush a little bit. The name of the game is to get your brush instead of having it like this, tilt it like this and go fast. Whoops, my and it, it, it doesn't want to have texture, but it will. If you go fast enough, you dab out your brush even more, you'll get even more of a textured look. Next, let's look at wet on wet with tea consistency. So first I'll pre-wet my paper and I already have a little bit of paint in my brush. I'll charge some tea consistency paint onto my wet paper. And this gives you really nice subtle effects, which is great for all kinds of situations from a light atmospheric sky to painting the delicate complexion of a child, which I will show you later. All right, now that you have the basic idea of tea consistency paint and how it works, let's look at some real world examples. These are gonna be clips from some of my Patreon tutorials, which by the way are real time from start to finish with downloadable line drawings and reference photos and supply lists and they're ad free. So if you're interested in learning any of these paintings you see behind me, anything I've painted in the last three years is probably a Patreon tutorial here. But anyway, let's look at some of these yummy little watercolor clips. <laughs> and remember, we're gonna start with the most basic techniques and work our way up to more complex things. So I found a ton of footage that I'm really excited to share with you, starting with fresh footage from my brand new painting that as of this recording, isn't finished yet. So let's look at the very beginning of this painting where I was blocking in where the fur goes. And very often I start a painting with a tea consistency application to either map in certain components that provide an important scaffolding to hold the painting together that need to be in the exact right spot. And that is true with this cat. I wanted to make sure I didn't paint on the part of the cat that had white fur because that would really mess up the markings. So I used a very conservative approach of painting with dry brush techniques on dry paper to block in areas that I wanted to make sure were in the right place. By the way, block in is a common term used across many different art mediums of painting, and it means to block in or put in the larger shapes at first in the first stages of painting to get the main design and underpainting in. And then as the painting progresses, you focus on smaller and smaller details. So anyway, here you see me blocking in the calico markings with dry brush techniques. Remember, dry brush techniques are mostly done on dry paper with fast, swishy strokes that leave a lot of texture. So here I've got some watery orange mixed up. And remember, your paint will dry a good bit lighter than it looks while wet. And often I paint the first blocking in extra light because it's an underlayer that I will use in subsequent paint applications to guide me where the main components begin and end. You'll see me do some wet and wet painting with this example, 
because when the painting is wet with a tea consistency layer, it affords me the perfect opportunity to paint in a few stripes with thicker cream consistency paint. And that thicker paint holds its shape for a few darker shapes of stripes within the area I'm working. And another thing to keep in mind, if you paint this first layer with a more dull, less saturated color mix, you run the risk of it being too dull looking. And with watercolor, it's hard to bring back pure saturated colors. It's much easier to start out too bright with your colors too popping. And if you need to calm them down or desaturate the color later, it's a lot easier to do that by just painting a glaze of tea consistency blue or complementary color over whatever bright color you want to gray down. So that's the beginning stage of this very tea consistency heavy beginning. Let's look at the middle stage of this painting when I paint the background, which I also relied on a lot of tea consistency techniques to paint a soft, dreamy, colorful background. If you remember, I showed you footage from the same painting last week, how I used milk consistency paint to splash in tree shapes that were kind of abstracted. And I splashed that wet into wet. Okay, let's look at the very beginnings of this background. I'd gotten rather tight with the painting of this cat, which is actually good news for my online students, especially my beginners, because it's about the easiest way there is to paint fur. However, for my own work, I do strive to be looser and more intuitive. So I slept on this painting and in the morning with a fresh perspective and new determination to loosen this back up, I used a much looser style to paint in the background. So let me show you how I did it. And if you remember last week when I talked about wet next to wet technique, where you're painting on dry paper, you're, but you're painting blobs of different colors next to each other and then they touch each other. So they kind of merge softly into each other, but also hold their colors and where they touch, they kind of mix together and make some really magical effects. Well, that's exactly what I did for this background. And I've got my three quarter oval here and I'm mixing up some of that gorgeous, almost neon Daniel Smith permanent green light. That's so gorgeous. And I immediately put some green on and then immediately add some yellow to it and let the colors kind of mix together on the paper itself. And for the best results of this technique, don't mix the color on your palette. Get everything really wet and put the colors next to each other and let them mix themselves on the watercolor paper itself. And this will result in much fresher looking color. And here I added a little dollop of cobalt blue. And you will notice I'm carefully painting around a few little slivers of white paper because that adds to me a little bit of a sparkle in the background. And it just adds sparkle in general, general to a painting when you're painting loose like this to keep a couple dry areas that stay perfectly white. I have splayed my brush bristles here to create a furry effect along the top of the cat. And then what you can do is if you start getting too many puddles, you use some toilet paper, lay it on top of your painting and then lift it off and it will lift off a lot of the water and not too much of the paint. And if you don't do this, what happens is that as that puddle dries, everything kind of runs together and you just get a blob of color instead of it having this dynamic look of yellow next to green, next to blue. Also notice how I painted the background right over the cat and that helps tie the cat to the painting on the shadow side of the cat. All right, now I wanna show you towards the end of the painting process where I'm starting to tie everything together and make the whole painting hang together as a cohesive whole. So what I'm doing is once my painting is completely dry, I'm getting some tea consistency cobalt blue and putting it in the corners and using a light touch because I don't want, I don't want to reactivate any of the paint that's already dry. I like to create a bit of a vignette look where the corners are darker and what that does is the same exact thing as when you go to a play and they use the stage lights to darken the whole stage except on the main actor. And that's the same exact thing I'm doing here in this painting. I'm dimming the stage lights all over this painting except where I want the viewer to look, and that is at the cat. So a lot of times in a lot of different paintings of lots of different things from beach scenes to a portrait of a child to a cat on a fence, I will darken the corners. And that's what you see me do here. I put some almost probably milk consistency cobalt blue in the corners and then use more tea consistency as I get 
further into the painting and then clear clean water to just blend it all so it goes from darker to lighter as you move into the painting and that's a vignette style of focusing the viewer's attention on the subject of interest Let's look at a couple more paintings that I started with a tea consistency underpainting, but in a more traditional way, where I cover much of the area in the first wash with tea consistency on dry paper. In this example, I painted different colors on the zebra depending on whether the area had a cool or warm leaning color. My reference photo told me that a lot of the zebra was in cool shadows, so I painted mostly what my reference photo showed me to do. But on the zebra's face, I painted yellows and oranges because the zebra was looking into warm light, making the front of the face warm. Again, I just replicated what my reference photo told me to do. This underpainting will serve as the undergirding for subsequent layers of stripes and details and will hold the whole painting together later as I finish it. I used a similar approach to start this painting of Parker. Young children have very delicate features with very few darks and very few super lights. So a tea consistency underpainting is often perfect for painting children. Also notice that I carry the underpainting right into the background, which helps the painting hang together as a cohesive whole after I add subsequent darker and smaller details over this initial wash when it dries. It is a very good habit to try to get into to paint both the subject and the background at the same time so that the painting hangs together better at the end. And this leads well into my next example where I did not follow this advice. I painted just the dog without adding any background. I got to the end of the process and what did I have on my hands? A cut out looking dog with too stark of a background. Ouch, oops, but hey, we have tea consistency paint and it will fix a lot of things, including this cut out dog look. After everything is perfectly dry, I mix up some blue tea consistency paint and swish it over the shadow side of the dog and background. My dog and background instantly become one and this helps get rid of that cut out look. I very often use this little trick to help fix this very common problem and almost always the best place to do it is in a shadow where it's okay, even preferable, for the edge of the subject and background to merge together and create more of a disappearing edge that lends that painterly look to a painting. Just don't go over the area too many times because your painting underneath the swish will reactivate. And so you use a soft brush and just one or two swishes on a bone dry painting. Now let's look at another example of using tea consistency towards the end of a painting to add final details and refinements that every painting will need at this stage. In this example, it's this cat and his back end was looking just a tad too light. So I let everything completely dry and painted some tea consistency Windsor Violet in fur shaped strokes to accomplish two things. One, add more fur texture complexity and two, balance out the values on his backside. And his backside had too much contrast in it. His fur was too light against a dark background and that high contrast was visually stunning and it was creating too much noise in the painting that distracts the viewer's eye. And this is a very common problem that is needed to balance out values to design where the viewer's eye goes. High contrast areas will draw the viewer's eye. Low contrast areas are quieter and help support the more interesting parts of the painting. So the second goal that I accomplished with tea consistency paint towards the end of this painting was to darken the cat's backside, which is an unimportant area, so it didn't call too much attention to that area and instead help the viewers know to look at the area of interest, which is the light glows and the facial area where notice most of the contrast and details in the painting reside. Another fun way I recently used tea consistency paint was in a painting I did just to have fun and do something easy that was accessible to both my beginner and advanced students, and that was these splashy tree boughs. I played around with several different techniques to create the canopy, including painting tea consistency paint onto a sieve and then blow spatter onto the painting with a straw, which this idea is courtesy of the amazing Diane Zimmerman, who has the wonderful Facebook group, Watercolor Beginners and Beyond. And she also has her own YouTube channel. So be sure to check out her great YouTube channel and Facebook group. Then when that dried, I felt my painting lacked cohesion. So I put wax paper down everywhere I didn't want spatter and took a brush full of tea consistency, M-gram, naphthol red, and made some spatter that had bigger drops. 
and made several clumps that I felt was the final touch that tied this whole painting together. All right, before we leave the easier section of this tutorial, I want to at least show one landscape example. But I want you to notice that although this is a landscape, the same rules, principles in general apply no matter what you're painting. So if you learn the basic rules of watercolor, you can paint anything. And when I teach on my Patreon, that's why my focus is often the why as much or more than the how. So you can take the principles and apply them to any subject. So for this landscape, just like the zebra, I start with an underpainting of tea consistency painting, letting everything melt together. In this example, I did start by getting everything wet with clear water and then charging in paint so everything stays as soft and dreamy as possible. And just like in the zebra where the there were cools like in the sky and water, I paint blues and where there's warms like in the foliage, I put greens and yellows. Then I let everything dry and started layering on more textured effects for the foliage. I love to use brushes that create interesting texture for both fur and foliage. And in this painting, I used my stencil brush and my cheap hardware store chip brush, which I boil and the boiling of that brush frays out the bristles. And so then you can use it to make really interesting textures. So I used wet on dry and dry on dry techniques and variations in color to get a realistic yet painterly tree foliage look. Okay, we have officially reached the super advanced section. And so I'm going to show you some techniques I used to paint this fox's fur in a recent Patreon watercolor tutorial I did that used some more complex advanced techniques to create really dynamic fur that, by the way, would also be great for trees, grass, waves. So I used a combination of tea consistency paint, a budding wet cream consistency paint, and then splashed in a little clear water here and there to create cauliflowers for an even more dynamic fur texture. So let's watch this in action. So here you see me painting in the cream consistency fur. And then next I go in with tea consistency paint and touch it here and there with the cream consistency paint. And then I paint a little milk consistency. And then I paint some more tea consistency. And you see I'm putting some splashes and putting some more tea consistency and putting it all together to make a really dynamic fur so it has a lot of different values in it. That really helps the fur look more interesting, more aesthetically pleasing, and to me, more watercolor-ish style, which I love that. I love my paintings to look like paintings, and this is a great way to get that effect. Let's look at another example of intuitive painting. This is a study I did in preparation for a larger commission I had to complete. So I sprayed my piece of paper first. I'm working on cold pressed paper, and I sprayed put little bits of spray here and there. So there are dry bits of paper there and there is wet bits of paper there. And what that does is it's like me holding the reins of a horse and then letting the reins go and letting the paint do what it wants when you pre-spray your paper like that. So again, that's why this is a more advanced technique. You kind of have to respond to whatever your paper does. So I've got some gray mixed up over there. It's cobalt blue and probably some burnt sienna in there to create a gray cloudy sky. And I'm gonna use tea consistency paint to create some clouds effects. Uh, and so this is wet and wet painting. And then what I'm gonna do when it's still wet, I'm gonna lift out a path for a rainbow and then I'm going to paint a rainbow in just so you know where I'm going here but see you can see those marks those smaller marks that I made are on drier paper they're holding their shape and it's this variety of edges that you get when you paint on paper that has wet areas and dry areas that it really gives you some nice variety of, of edges and if anything gets too stiff you can just spray it like I did right there and then dot it up a little bit of paint with a tissue so I'm responding to my paint as the painting unfolds in front of me. This is called intuitive painting, where you just respond to what the paint is doing. You babysit it. You're letting the paint do its thing. And if it needs a little help, you might give it a little dab with a tissue, or you might add a little bit of water or a little bit of spray, just depending on what effect you're seeing unfold and how you want it to change. So this is a great way to paint a sky. And as you can see, because I'm using cobalt blue, which has a beautiful granulation effect by itself or in mixes with burnt sienna, I'm starting to see some really pretty granulation effects too, which is really fun to see. And here I'm going in with what we call a thirsty brush. So I wring out the brush 
and I pick up a path that I'm going to paint the rainbow into. I go over the paper several times and this is where the importance of good paper comes in because a cheaper paper won't let you do this. This is probably Hannah Mule, the collection paper, 140 pound, or my Arsh cold press, 140 pound. To paint this wet and to lift up paint and really work this paper, uh, cheaper papers usually won't allow this. Next, you'll see me paint this rainbow one stripe at a time, which I don't recommend. Instead, before you start your painting session, load up a one inch wide brush with all the colors, then swipe it onto the damp paper. If you paint your rainbow on dry paper, it will not look soft and ethereal like a rainbow should. It has to be on damp paper. Too wet and your rainbow will explode into fuzzy nothingness. Too dry and it will look like a stamped on cartoon rainbow. That's why painting practice rainbows is a great way to practice wet and wet techniques because both the paper moisture levels and your paint consistency have to be perfect to get the soft haze but controlled rainbow effect you want. Plus it's just fun to paint rainbows. And I had to practice a lot because I had a very serious commission I had to put a rainbow in. So I did these studies a lot before I did the commission. Thank you so much for joining me for this tutorial. I can't wait to figure out where I'm gonna go after this. I'm not sure, it's definitely gonna be techniques heavy. I've been taking polls over on my community tab asking you all what you're interested in and the resounding uh, answer is you want techniques videos. So I am going, my goal, I'm not always gonna meet this goal, but my goal is every week to put out a techniques video. And if you check out my shorts, I know a lot of you don't like shorts, but I put, I don't put out crappy shorts. I put out stuff that has really good information in it. So go check out my shorts. There's so much good stuff and they're only a minute long. They won't waste your time. They're packed full of information. So go check out my shorts. And I have tons of content that I've built up over the years on this YouTube channel. Go check out all my hacks videos, subscribe, because I will have a techniques video very soon for you again. So anyway, thank you so much again. I appreciate it. Now go watercolor your world. Bye everybody.